One of the greatest things I ever realized, and it really set me free once I realized it, was that my value was not based on my performance. That my value is not based on my performance. I am highly allergic to failure. Anybody else highly allergic to any perfectionists, right? And it's kind of one of those things when people talk about perfectionists, it's like the thing they throw out there when you're in an interview for a job and they're like, what are some of your weaknesses? And instead of saying like, well, I never show up on time and I'm always tempted to steal from the cash register, you say things like, well, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, right? But if you actually are a perfectionist, it means that you have to be right all the time. You cannot fail. You cannot be wrong. You've always... And, you know, uh, I wouldn't do things if I thought I would fail at them. You know, I said I was risk averse, but I was just afraid to fail. And when I became a believer, I found out that even those things that I thought were really good that I did were still garbage. Right? And you say, what? Yeah. Yeah, the Bible said that all of my righteousness, all of the good things I thought I'd do, when they are, they're added up to what's expected, it, it's... it's Filthy rags, right? It's kind of like this. It's kind of like, imagine someone said, you've got to jump across the Grand Canyon. You've got to jump across the Grand Canyon, and you're going to say, okay, well, I'm going to jump, and maybe I get seven feet, and then I start falling. Maybe you get eight feet, or maybe someone gets ten feet, and they start falling. But the, the answer is, nobody's getting over right? Nobody's getting over. And I realized that it wasn't about my performance. It was about Christ's performance. My value did not come from me being good enough. My value came from him being good enough and him placing value on me. I'm not perfect, but I don't have to be because Christ is. Are you ready to get depressed for a moment? I see too many of you smiling after all of that. So this is church. There's no fun in church. And so we have to, I have to depress you for a second. Are you important? Are you valuable? Do you have any value? And people, they measure this in many different ways, don't they? They measure this in many different ways. Uh, maybe it's your money, right? How much money do you have? Maybe it's your job. What job do you have? Well, I'm so-and-so at such-and-such a place. Or I used to do this, or I used to, to have this. And they say, that's what makes you important. Or where is your house, and what does your house look like? Or what brand name clothes are those? Or how much did those shoes cost? Or is that jewelry real? People find value in possessions. The car that you drive, or maybe it's the approval of others. I feel like I'm important, I feel like I'm a big deal, because people like me. Or I would be a big deal, or I would feel good about myself if people liked me. Or if you had lots of followers or friends, maybe it's accomplishments. Maybe it's accomplishments. If you do enough or have done enough or will do enough, that's when you actually have importance or value. Or how many degrees or how, many, how needed you are. If people need you and miss you. Here's the sad part. Here's the depressing part. Someone always has more than you. And someone is always better than you. And has done more. And they did it while they were younger. And they did it faster. And they did it with less. Same with me too. Is that what makes us important? Is that what gives us value? Because what happens when you can't do those things anymore? What happens when you can't do those things anymore? There will come a day, whether because of illness. Or maybe an accident. Or maybe because of time. An economic downturn. I spoke with someone this past week, and they said in the economic turmoils that they have, they, they've lost $150,000. And I'm like, wow, wouldn't it be great to have $150,000 to lose? I'm like, he's like, oh, it'll come back, it'll come back. I'm like, do you need a church home? <laughs> I didn't actually say that, but you better believe I thought it. Let me, let me take this. What if you weren't born that capable? What if you weren't born that smart? What if you weren't born that healthy? Does this mean that you will never have value or that you will never be important? You and I, thank God, do have value. 
And regardless of your possessions and your portfolio and your performance, we have it. And we're going to see why this morning. Would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26? As we continue in our series on the book of Genesis, in the beginning, we get questions answered. Questions that we have to have answered. And today we see in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26, the word of God says this. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. And the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God said, or God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, I pray, to the reading of your word. As you've promised, I pray that it would accomplish exactly what you sent it forth to do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What we've seen in Genesis chapter 1 is God giving us the day-by-day chronological account of how everything was created. And then in Genesis 2, he dives into some of the specifics about how things were created, and he pays special attention to mankind. He pays special attention to mankind. The conversation that he has in verse 26 teaches us something about who God is. It says in 26 in the beginning, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who was God talking to? What do you mean us? Our, right? This was a conversation between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This was a conversation between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Even in the very first chapter of the Bible, we are taught of a trinity, a three in one, three different persons, one in essence. And here God has the conversation saying, we are going to make man, and we are going to make man in our image. This is important because the idea of the trinity is that it is three persons, one in essence, And it's always been this way. Jesus Christ did not begin in Bethlehem. He has always been God the Son, and he existed before this world was even created. He has always existed. And it's co-eternal. They've always been God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Equal, co-equal. They've never been uh, God the Father is is not more God than God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. And we know that these things are true from what the Bible teaches us in later passages. But here God said we're going to make man and we're going to make man in our image. We're going to make man in our image. And see, we're different than any other thing that God made. If you were to talk to the naturalist, if you were to talk to the secularist today, he would tell you that man is simply a more higher evolved animal. That there's nothing different about us than any other animals on here. We just happen to be the apex right now we happen to be at the top right now that's what they would say but god here says that man was created in his own image he didn't say that about any of the sea life that he made he didn't say that about any of the creatures that fly or any of the land animals or any of the creeping things he singles out man and says this will be different and man will be made in our image god made mankind we are not an accident We are not the chance development of unguided natural process. And if you have questions about what that means, listen to the previous sermon from last week in the series. For time's sake, we won't revisit it again. But the complexity of our bodies screams out that we were designed and created. I I had a chance to share the gospel with somebody, and this, this gentleman, I just met him for the first time. We were at a seminar together, and he's talking to me about how he's becoming an EMT, and he's in school for it. And he said, it's amazing how complex the human body is. He says, I'm just amazed at the complexity of the human body. I'm studying all these different systems. And if you mess with this, with medicine, then this happens over here. And it's so complex. And I'm like, it is really complex, isn't it? He's like, yeah, it just blows my mind. I'm like, that's mighty suspicious how complex it is, isn't it? And he kind of nodded and said, it is pretty suspicious how complex it is. And it turns out he was already a believer. And he recognized the idea that, yeah, pretty suspicious that it all works together how it works together 
especially on the level of DNA and the fact that all of the information that we need inside of us, unique to each of us, is encoded in its own language and is lived out in all the cells of our body. It's just, it's just amazing. It says that God created man. Look in Acts 17, would you? We have these inspired words, this preaching of the Apostle Paul in the city of Athens. Paul was a, a missionary church planter. He had an amazing transformation in his life. He was, for all intents and purposes, what we would call a terrorist. He tracked down Christians, had them arrested, and then murdered until he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus, uh, with the risen Lord, and his life was changed, and he became a traveling preacher where people would come to know the Lord. He'd organize them into churches after having baptized them. And so here he is in the city of Athens preaching, and he teaches us about God beginning in verse 24. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, it says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Notice the phrase in verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. All nations, all people groups, God has made from one blood. Did you know that there is only one race? The human race. That's what God says. We're all of one blood. And regardless of what we look, the color of our hair or our eyes or the shade of our skin or whether we're tall or skinny or our bone structure, we are all one blood and we are all related. And when God made Adam and Eve and included inside of them all of the variation that would be needed, all of the genetic information inside of them to produce people that look like all the different folks in the earth, you can tell that God designed it that way because he wanted the world to be filled with people and to be filled with people with diversity and variation inside of them. God thought that that's what he wants in heaven is his church. It says if they happily seek after him, they will find him because he's that near. Do you want to know how I know that God wants a bunch of people and a great multitude of diversity around him in heaven? Because we find at the end of the book, that's who ends up in heaven. Would you look in Revelation chapter 5 with me? It's a little bit early in my notes for those that are looking for the verse upstairs. Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 9. This is a glimpse into the throne room of God of what things will look like. And it says in Revelation 5, Revelation 5, verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. These are the ones that are worshiping God around his throne. Look in Revelation 7 and verse 9. This one's not on the screens, but it says... Revelation 7, 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Do you know who will be around the throne, worshiping our great God? People that look like every group that you could imagine on this planet. That's who will worship our God. And so the heart of God is to want these people to know him and to be with him. He made us of one blood. He also made us a living soul. Would you look back in our passage? Actually, we're going to jump to chapter 2, Genesis 2 and verse number 7. In Genesis 2 and verse number 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God did not do this with any of the other living things that he created. He created us a living soul so now that we would have a way to commune with God, to have fellowship with God that was different than any other thing that he created. He breathed into us that breath of life. And now mankind was different. He also gave us a mandate. Keep reading verses 8 and 9 in Genesis 2. It says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man 
whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We'll get more about those trees in just a moment. It says in verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. If you want to know what the oldest occupation is, it's a gardener. That's the oldest occupation. A gardener. God took man and he put Adam into the garden to dress it and to keep it. Now, was this before or after man sinned and the fall? Before. So did you know that work is not a part of the curse? Now, work got a whole lot harder after the curse fell. We found that out. But work is actually something that God designed for man to partake in. Mankind ought to work, to put his hands to something, to do something, to cultivate, to help, to grow. This was something that was designed intentionally that the Lord had. So I know some people are like, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven and, and we're not going to have to work anymore and it's just going to be... I, I don't know that you and I are going to uh, sit back and do nothing. I think the Lord's going to have something for us and I think we'll be grateful to have it. If any of you have ever been out of work for a long period of time and it wasn't because you wanted it, you probably missed it, didn't you? You probably missed it. Maybe not at first, but laid up in a bed doing nothing all day, that's no way to be. You'll find that that brings its own challenges and its own difficulty. He gave a stewardship of the earth. Look in verse 28 of Genesis chapter 1. He says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God gave us this world to steward it, to steward it. Now, if you steward something, that means you manage it. You take care of it on behalf of somebody else, right? It's not yours, but you're taking care of it like it's yours. So what should our attitude towards this earth be if we're good stewards? Should we take care of it? Should we be mindful of the consequences of our actions upon it? Right? It says we have dominion and caretaking over the, the animals that are on it. Should, our, should we be mindful of what we do to them? Yes. But should we worship it? No. Right? We should be very careful not to worship the creation over the creator. We should be very careful not to give ourselves to the saving of this world and leaving off to the saving of souls of men and women and boys and girls. We ought to be very careful to be good stewards, but not to turn the stewardship of this earth into an idol, where all we care about is that over people, because God gave us these things to steward for the growth and the care of his people. God wants us to be fruitful, he says. He, he gave them the instruction here after he created man and woman in his image and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He's saying, I want many people on here because God wants us to have fellowship with him. He did not need us, but he wanted us. If God needed anything, that would mean that he was less than perfect, and that would mean that he wasn't God. But because he is God and he is perfect, he did create us, and he wants many people to know him and to have relationship with him. We'll talk about the repercussions of the fall and what that means for that. Just a quick note here. Uh, we are reading a Bible uh, that is faithful, mature, and accurate. It's reliable. Uh, we have uh, Elizabethan English here, so when we read the Word of God, we are reading words from what were translated from certain languages, Greek and Hebrew, into English at this time. And so uh, the time that it was translated was a couple hundred years ago, about 400 years ago, which means that sometimes the words that we read in English have the meaning of the time in which they were written instead of the meaning that you and I might put on them. So you can read here about the word replenish and get the idea that maybe that means that there was a gap or that something happened. Because oftentimes when we take the word or the prefix re to reapply, right? It means to do something again. This is actually, um, the word was borrowed from French, which is replanir, which means to fill completely. So don't let that bother you in your mind when you read this here about the age of the earth. When God repeats something over and over again, it is volume control. When God repeats something over and over again, it's like he's turning up the volume for you and I to pay closer attention. 
it says in verse 27, notice this. It says, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. In verse 26, it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Anyone picking up a little bit of a repetition here? It seems pretty important that God wants us to understand that we were made in his image. So then, does that mean that God was um, 5'10", had brown hair, brown eyes, wore glasses, exceptionally handsome? <laughs> no, God is a spirit. He has, he's not limited by a body. He has no need for a body. But there's something about God, it says, that we are like him. We are made in his likeness. We are made in his image. And that is the immaterial part of us. Like God, we can create. We can design. We can use logic and reason. We can use communication, language, not just to share uh, needs, but also to discuss abstract ideas. We can not just build tools, but use tools to make tools. We're on a, a whole different level than any of the other parts of his creation. We also are moral beings, right? Knowing right from wrong. My dog is not upset when she steals food from counter surfing off of the, the kitchen counter. She's not upset when she eats a whole pan full of noodles. She's not. Until we yell at her. She is not a moral being. She just knows, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. They're yelling at me. She is not held accountable for sin because she doesn't have that kind of moral agency. She knows how I get in trouble and how I don't get in trouble, but she doesn't think about right and wrong. But you and I, we understand the morality that God has given us. In fact, he's written some of that into our heart and our conscience as what is true and false and right and wrong. And so God has given us his image, and that is what gives you and I value. We were created on purpose to have relationship with God, and he placed enough value on us to make us in his own image to make us like him. In fact, that's the reason that God will, in Genesis, uh, after the flood, right? When God will, after the flood, give us the basis of government where he says, if someone kills another person, if he sheds the blood of another man, that killer will also lose his life. Why? Because he killed someone that was made in the image of God. We live in a society that desperately wants to say that everybody is valuable regardless of what they look like, of their life experience, of where they've been. I want you to know without God, that cannot be true. Without God, you end up with survival of the fittest. And that means that certain people will rise to the top. And in the hierarchy of this world and the structure of this world, those who rise to the top are then, quote, the best. So when you take God out of the idea of creation, when you take God out of the mat, you do not have any basis for looking at someone and saying, you are just as valuable as someone else. It's a startling thing to think about. You say, how does it go on then? How do people keep arguing for things like justice and to, to celebrate diversity and things like that? They're living on borrowed morality. They've borrowed the morality of our Judeo-Christian background, but once they realize that they don't have anything to stand on, it will turn ugly very quickly, and we've seen that happen around the world. We are made in God's image, and so we have value. Now, the last part of verse 27, you would imagine, would just be a footnote that we wouldn't need to stop and talk about, but there's a lot of confusion in our culture right now. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. When God created man, he created them male and female. They were distinct. They were different. He created two genders, two sexes, and he did so based on their genetics. There was no society for them to be a part of yet, for it to be a societal construct. It was something that God created intentionally for a man and woman to be men and women. And they, they're different right? They're different from each other, but there's also variation inside of what is a man and what is a woman, right? Not all men are the same and not all women are the same. 
right? Those of you that have had children may have noticed a great difference between your girl children and your boy children, even among themselves, right? For example, if a man enjoys hunting and fishing and being outdoors and he drives a truck and he's got a beard, that doesn't make him any more or less of a man than the gentleman who wants to wear uh, fine clothing and sweaters and reads books and enjoys the symphony and, uh, and, and reads and writes and... Uh, they're, they're, they're both men, aren't they? It's just different in style and personality, and God made us to have these gifts and these talents. Same thing with ladies, right? Not every lady is the same. I have one daughter who loves to dress up as a, as a princess, you know? Bows in her hair, she wants to look just right, and she's, she's very delicate and feminine a lot of the time. I have another one who said she wants to go to police school because it'd be fun and I get to arrest people. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> right? You say, what's the deal? What, are, they, are they not both women? Yeah, of course they're both female, but there's differences inside of them. And so because there's differences, they are still male and female. And they're just as valid as an expression because they are who God made them to be. But one cannot become the other. And what we have today is something that, uh, with the, the transgenderism that, that people are uh, talking about. And it's, it's a big part of society right now. How many of you are familiar with the big part of transgenderism? It's kind of going on. There's been a lot of uh, news reports about people that have transitioned from one gender to another and then engaged in sports of their target gender that they transitioned to. And then they said that you know, things were unfair and it's created some issues, right? You probably heard a lot of these things. And the term that's tossed around is gender dysphoria, where you don't feel like you match the gender that you were assigned at birth or the sex that you were assigned at birth, right? You don't feel like you, you um, match that. And I, I started looking up the, the conversations that people who say that they suffer from gender dysphoria, what, what it felt like and what it was like to be that way. And they said it can manifest as distress, depression, anxiety, restlessness, unhappiness. Uh, they could be angry or sad. They could be slighted or feel negative about their body or like that there's parts of them that are missing. They feel isolated or lonely. They feel a need oftentimes to change themselves into something else or to have other people view them as something else. And they say that that's, that that's what this idea of gender dysphoria was or is. I want you to know that though there are a select small number of people that suffer from the illness that you would call gender dysphoria, which was considered to be a medical illness until just recently as things changed societally, um, there are people that legitimately struggle with some of these ideas, but they've, they've taken the symptoms and they've connected it to the wrong problem. What's wrong with them is not that they were born the wrong gender. It's the same thing that's wrong with all of us. And it's that you and I were hardwired. We were created to have a relationship with our God. We were created to have a relationship with the Creator God. In fact, we are incomplete without Him. And there is something wrong with us. There is something broken with us. And they, oftentimes people that, that struggle with this area that they talk about, they feel like they're not what they're supposed to be. And the answer is they aren't what they're supposed to be. But then again, people who don't struggle with this, neither are you and I what we're supposed to be. You see, we fall short because we're all sinners and we're all part of this curse that's passed upon this, this earth and upon this bloodstream of humanity. We, it's all been polluted because of it and it may manifest itself in different ways. The incompletion, the distress that we feel at being fallen and not being what we are. But see, that is the core of it because, and, and how, how you know this is, as sad as it is, there's a um, strangely large percentage of people that are... that refer to themselves as transgendered, uh, that, that try and commit suicide or do commit suicide. It is almost 10 times the national average. It's almost 10 times the national average. Uh, and, and you would say, well, does it get better as they transition? As they change their bodies through hormones, as they change their bodies through clothing and appearance, as they change their bodies through irreparable surgery, and they create a new persona, and everyone now regards them as their new gender, and they didn't even know that they used... The sad thing is, the suicidality does not go down. The rate doesn't change. You say, why? Because they did not fix what was wrong with them. 
They did not address the heart issue, the spirit issue of them being dead spiritually and needing to be raised to life again through a relationship with God and Jesus Christ. That is why they feel distressed and isolated and lonely. A lot of people feel this. It just doesn't manifest the same way. And the answer is the same answer for everybody, is that they get that life-transforming relationship with God because nothing that you or I can do in and of our own selves is ever going to make us satisfied or feel complete. It's something that will always, 100% of the time, take the gospel because that's what makes broken people whole. That's what takes the sick spiritually and makes them better. That's what takes the dead and makes them alive. No one else's approval will do it, and no level of achievement of success will do it, and no amount of hormone treatment or transition surgery or identity alignment will solve the problem that's deep inside of the soul of men and women. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You may not like how you feel. You may not feel good about your body. You may not feel like you're what you ought to be. But God made you exactly as he wants you to be. And that there is great beauty and value inside of that. And you don't need to become some other thing, horizontally speaking. Vertically, you need that life-giving relationship with God so that as a man, a woman, a boy, or girl, you finally are complete in him. Because that's the only place you'll ever be complete. That's the only place I will ever be complete. You don't need to change your body. You need to be born again and live in relationship with God. And the roles that God gave men and women are distinct, but they're equal and they're beautiful. They're equal in value. There are different roles, and we'll talk about those in days to come. So what does God ask of us here? How do we even apply something like this lesson? The first thing that God's word is challenging us to do is to view all mankind as relatives to view all mankind as relatives. God created all of us, and he created all the people groups, and they're all in the image of God. And any variation of any person that you see today is the same exact race as you. Did you know there aren't even different colors? There's different shades. There's something called melanin that certain skin types produce that other skin types don't. And if you have more of it, your skin appears darker. If you have less of it, your skin appears white. We are all one race. We are all one blood. There may be different backgrounds and different cultures and different ethnicities, but we are all the same and we're all made in the image of God. And you may not like certain groups of people for whatever reason, but I want you to know that is not the heart of God. You cannot be prejudiced. You cannot be racist and say that you have the mind of Christ. You can't because that's not what he wants. That's not what he wants. We've already seen what he wants. In fact, you're related to them. And don't you want your relatives to know Christ and to be saved? Don't you want them to be in heaven? We should share and show the gospel regardless of the variation of the people around us, for they're all our brothers and sisters. View all mankind as relatives. Second of all, become who God created you to be. Become who God created you to be. We've been given a spirit and a soul and a body. A spirit is how we commune with God where our conscience lives, our, our soul is our intellect, our, our emotion and our will, what we think and how we feel and what we choose to do. And of course, the body is what we see in front of us. And we're to love God with all of those aspects of us. But God has also given us creativity and humor and wit and invention. And he gave us these things to develop them. God made you a whole person, meaning there's more to you than just your body. There's more to you than just your mind right? We're, we're more than that. And here's what I'm concerned of. You know what I see in myself and in others? We are being turned into consumers and not producers. We're being turned into people that just watch. I mean, think about it. You can go home and you can binge watch Netflix and you can buy your stuff off Amazon and you can get your food from Uber Eats and just sit and consume and consume and make no contribution to this world to never grow into the potential that God has placed inside of you. We have, by the Spirit of God, such an ability to change people's lives, to make this world a more beautiful place, not in neglect to the spiritual needs of ourselves or others, but we are a whole person. 
We should be reading and writing and singing and playing and exploring and looking at the sunshine. And we should be doing so much more than what we have been, which is being plugged into a machine and just being turned into a dollar sign. God made us for more than that. That's why you and I are so anxious. That's why we're so anxious, because we're not living out the fullness of the life that God has created us to live in, to be in. There's more of us to that. And so I'm I'm challenging you, turn off the television. Put down your phone. Shut off the video games. And pick up an instrument. Start singing. Write a hymn. Write a song. Write a story. Write a poem. Read a book. Not just something that uh, is like a how-to, but something deep that makes you think. Ask questions. Get in conversations. Interact with people. Right? Right? Make this world a better place with what God has placed inside of you. Be who it is that God has created you and saved you to become. And only as we say no to this world and yes to the Lord and step in the fullness of his spirit will we make that contribution that God so designed us to make. The last thing is to find completion in Christ. Find completion in Christ. So many people recognize that they aren't what they're supposed to be. Me too. Me too. How many of you are happily perfect with your mind and your body and your prayer life and your Bible reading and your marriage relationship and your parenting and your relationship at work with your employees? How many of you are perfectly happy with all of those things? Please become my life coach. If whoever... I, I'm not, and you're not. If we're honest, you're not. And so the answer is not getting better It's becoming complete in Jesus Christ. I'm not perfect, but I don't have to be because he is. I'm not always right, but I don't have to be because he always is. I'm not always as loving or caring as I ought to be, but the good news is I don't have to be because he already is, and he can live through me. His life in me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is only the life-forming, life-transforming relationship with Christ that will make you complete. Nothing that you can change about your body is going to do that. Nothing you can change about how people view you is going to do that. It will still leave you unsatisfied. That's why the Lord Jesus came. To save us from our sin. You see, our sin separated us from God, and it marred that life-giving relationship. You ever seen what happens to a branch that has fruit on it, and the branch is ripped off the tree? What happens to the fruit? It dies, doesn't it? It shrivels up. Why? Because it wasn't connected to the source of life. And that's what happens spiritually when you and I do not have Christ as our Savior, or we are saved, but we have very little to do with him. That's what happens. That's why we we shrivel up on the inside. That's why some people never know fruitfulness or contentment, because they don't have that life. We find it only in Jesus Christ and in him alone. You see, the Lord Jesus became a man without ceasing to be God, and he lived a sinless life. And he died, not by accident, but on purpose. He laid down his life for us and as us when he died on the cross. And he promised that not only would he forgive our sins, but he would give us eternal life. And did you know he rose from the grave to prove that he was who he said he was and that you and I really can have eternal life because he lives eternally. That is completion. That is satisfaction. That is what, friend, you have been looking for your entire life. And that's why nothing has ever been enough up till this point. Because you were hardwired. You were made for it. And you can receive him today. You can receive him. He went to great length to repair that relationship between you and God. But only once you, by faith, believing that he died for you and rose from the grave, only once you pray and ask him to forgive your sins and be your savior, can you finally have what you've been missing, which is God himself. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes for a moment? We have in our church what we call a time of invitation where we invite you to act on what it is that God is speaking to you about. And I don't know what he's speaking to you about. 
You may be here today, and maybe you don't know Christ as Savior. You're not a bad person, but you're not really a church person either, and, and all of this stuff about being complete in him and not feeling satisfied and feeling like something's missing and always looking for the next thing, and it's just never enough. Maybe that, that hit home with you, and you say, I, I want to trust Christ today. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around just between me and you and God, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. Is there anybody like that today that say, I, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure, but I'd like to know. Anybody like that today? Just slip your hand up and write back down. No one's looking around. I just want to pray for you. Anybody like that today at all? Saying, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I, I don't feel complete. I don't feel like I have what you talked about, but I want it. Anyone like that? Believer, are there people that you just don't like because of the way they look or the language they speak or the culture that they represent? Has God spoken to you about how that's repugnant to our Savior who gave his life? He tasted death for every man. If he has, repent of it. Bring it before God and say, Lord, forgive me. Give me your heart. Help me to have the mind of Christ about them. Maybe you're here today and you don't feel like you're what you're supposed to be. Maybe it's over the issue of gender and you feel uncomfortable in your own body and you feel uncomfortable in, in the way that you've been described and treated in society. I want you to know, friend, that changing your body or changing your hormones or changing your personality to others, that will never satisfy. You need Jesus Christ. You were made to live in relationship with him. Come to him today. Be set free from those things. Nothing that you or I can do to change ourselves will ever bring what needs to happen. And that's new life in Christ. Maybe it's not over gender, but it's over something else. Repeated sin in your life. Unhappiness unthankfulness. You're always angry. You're always upset. Something's always going wrong. It's never enough. You've turned to alcohol. You've turned to drugs. You've turned to, to sex. You've turned to pornography. You've turned to a host of things to try and numb that little part of you that says you're not enough. Listen to it today and realize you're not enough, but Jesus Christ is, and he wants to make you whole. In just a moment, we'll stand and sing. If that's you, I'm going to be down here in the front of the aisle. You just slip out of your seat and come and let me know and say, Pastor, I want to know for sure I'm saved. Someone will take the Bible, a gentleman with a gentleman, a lady with a lady, and they'll show you how you can know without a shadow of a doubt that heaven is your home and Christ is your Savior. Father, be glorified in this hour. May we find our value in you. May you be glorified in how your children obey you in this time. In Jesus' name. Amen.